Pastor Marie Veritas, and I'll just have the great joy of reflecting with you on the mercy of God. Uh, so let's start with a prayer. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We bless you for your goodness to us, for choosing us, uh, for choosing to die out of love for us. And we ask you right now, Lord, to fill us with your spirit that we might know ourselves deeply to be loved and that we might know your mercy in a powerful way. We ask this in your name and through the intercession of our blessed mother Mary, as we pray, hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Our Lady of Sorrows, pray for us. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. So growing up, uh, you know, us kids, we worked on Good Friday, you know, so things like cleaning our rooms and tidying the house, taking out the trash, that kind of thing. Um, but mom said that because Jesus worked so hard for us, you know, it was right to work hard for him on that day. Um, and so I had never actually heard about the seven last words until I entered the convent. And I remember sitting in the, the big kind of empty church, bare, very solemn, the empty tabernacle, which is typical of Good Friday, and uh, hearing the priest speak on the seven last words of Jesus so beautifully, so powerfully. And yeah, I was just thinking, like, it's right, you know, it's right that we do this. Um, Mom was right, you know, the sisters were right, the church is right. There's something right about entering into the labor of Jesus on Good Friday, you know, entering right into his heart uh, on the day when the world was turned upside down by love. So I think wherever you are this Good Friday, you know, um, wherever you are in life, to know that Jesus is laboring for your heart uh, and he desires to speak his word to you his word of love, uh, because in fact, each of the words from the cross are for you. Uh, and, and you know, as so many of the gospel figures encounter Jesus in life and beheld him on the cross, as we'll be meditating on uh, today, um, you know, we too are called to encounter him um, now, you know, in all the messiness and reality of life, to encounter his merciful love. Um, and we know, we know, right, like life is messy, like, we're sinners, we know that. Um, sin, we know the feeling of, of sin. Sin distorts us, it lies about who we are. Um, we, in, in sin, we settle for less, right? Because we're afraid of emptiness. It's sort of like this cheap satisfaction. We know it in our bones, we know the sting of, of lying to ourselves. Um, but mercy, you know, the mercy of Jesus on the cross fights for us. You know, mercy is not just a passive response, you know, a sort of a defense against sin. Mercy is on the offensive. Mercy is an active choosing. You know, and St. Therese actually talks about this. She shares the story of, uh, or the image of, you know, a son of a doctor who's walking along the way and falls and hurts his leg, you know, and, and his father, the doctor, comes and runs to him and binds his leg and heals him and how that's an image of the mercy of God. But then she gives another deeper image. She says, the mercy of God is, is also like this, that the father, even before the son sets out on his journey, goes and scopes out the road and sees a dangerous rock that could cause his son to stumble and goes ahead of his son and removes the rock so that the son never even falls. But, and he doesn't even know. But that too is the mercy of God, right? You know, St. Therese would say, he's forgiven me not just much, but everything. You know, without waiting for me to love him much, as St. Mary Magdalene did, God has made me understand how he has loved me with an ineffable, and, an ineffable love and forethought, so that my love may know no bounds. You know, mercy seeks us out. Um, every breath we take, really, is a result of the mercy of God. We live by his mercy. Um, everything in our lives is a result of his mercy. Uh, and the emptiness of, I think, we're so often afraid of, right, is actually meant to be a space to receive the mercy of God. Uh, and mercy, it's like 
it's amazing. You know, it, his mercy takes what is broken, takes what is empty, and makes it new, bringing a greater good out of it than if it hadn't broken at all. And this actually reminds me of one of my favorite stories of um, Peter Cropper. And he was a famous British violinist. And he had uh, one day this incredible opportunity from the Royal Academy of Music uh, as a special honor for his achievements to play this very special, valuable uh, 258 year old Stradivarius violin, one of the most valuable in the world, um, and, and to play at this very prestigious Finland concert. And so Peter, of course, you know, accepted. Um, and so on the day of the concert, the anticipation was super high. And as Peter was walking onto stage, carrying the violin, he fell. And he fell right on top of the violin. And it, it totally broke. The, the neck snapped off and the body of the violin was, was completely cracked. Uh, and it was a disaster, you know, or, or so he thought. Uh, but a master craftsman heard of the incident and contacted Peter and offered to repair the violin. And the Royal Academy of Music, you know, reluctantly agreed and gave him the violin to repair. But everyone was very hesitant because they knew, you know, you can't fix a broken Stradivarius violin. It's one of a kind. It's ancient. It's, it's just kind of something, you know, unrepeatable. Um, but they let him have it. Eventually, not, not too long after, Peter Cropper got a call. It was the master craftsman. He said the violin was ready. And so Peter came to his workshop, very nervous, you know, and saw the violin. It was perfect. And when he picked it up to play it and played the first few notes, he was astonished because the vibrancy, the resonance of the sound was more beautiful than it had been before it broke. What an image of the mercy of God. He makes all things new. And, and in the mystery of his love, everything is for you. You know, everything is meant to draw you closer to his heart. You know, he even allows our sins um, only so that they might be paths to his heart where we can be received by the prodigal son and made new. You know, there's a great quote from St. Faustina's diary where she says, all grace flows from mercy. Let no one doubt concerning the goodness of God. Even if a person's sins were as dark as night, God's mercy is stronger than our misery. One thing alone is necessary, that the sinner set ajar the door of his heart, be it ever so little, to let in a ray of God's merciful grace, and then God will do the rest. You know, Jesus hangs upon the cross as the most perfect manifestation of the mercy of God, he who is God. You know, but how often, you know, I even know in my own life, how often we are, to, you know, we're, we're so afraid sometimes to look at him, to look at Jesus on the cross. Because first, we have to, we have to acknowledge crucifixion was a terrible thing, really, really awful. And the crucifixion of God is uh, something the most awful, right? It's the most awful thing. Um, and even there's a, um, a man named Seneca who lived around the time of Jesus. And he said, there's this quote from him, from his moral letters. He said, is there such a thing as a person who would actually prefer wasting away in pain on a cross, dying limb by limb, one drop of blood at a time, rather than dying quickly? Would any human being willingly choose to be fastened to that cursed tree, especially after the beating that left him deathly weak, deformed, swelling with vicious welts on shoulders and chest, and struggling to draw every last agonizing breath? Anyone facing such a death would plead to die rather than to mount the cross. But yet, this is the death that Jesus chose to undergo for us. For you. you know, he willingly ascended the cross for you. He was not passively accepting what happened to him. He was actively receiving the Father's will, actively choosing our salvation, your salvation, actively loving us, actively loving you. And he desires that we come to him, that we gaze upon him, just as the Israelites, you know, came and gazed upon the serpent on the pole that Moses erected. 
you know, that we gaze upon Jesus on the cross, that we might have new life, that we might be made new. The mercy of God is an active thing, pursuing your heart. You know, and there's no sin or darkness bigger than the mercy of Jesus Christ. There's no sin or darkness bigger than the mercy of Jesus Christ. Wherever you are right now in life, you know, whatever you've done or haven't done, uh, whatever mistakes you've made or opportunities you've missed, you know, come to him. Come to Jesus on the cross. You know, come to the one who desires not to condemn you, but to save you. You know, no one can replace you in his heart. No one. You are irreplaceable, unrepeatable, uniquely loved, uniquely chosen by him. You know, let his mercy wash over you, make you new, make you whole. You know, your life, your love matter to him. So many of the women we serve in our Hope and Healing mission, you know, uh, women who have suffered after abortion, believed for a long time that they were beyond help, that they were beyond God's mercy. But nothing and no one is beyond God's mercy. You know, you are not a burden. He delights in you. You know, be not afraid to come to him. Give him permission. So let's just close uh, with a prayer together. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Jesus, I give you permission to enter my life. I come to you at the foot of the cross and I surrender to you my heart with all its sins, wounds, and burdens. Lord, have mercy on me. Jesus, I trust in you. For the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Know of our prayers for you. Amen.